Hello, my friends. Welcome to a special episode of Wordboard, where we're going to take some extended time to untangle one of the most complicated, controversial subjects in all the Bible. Is Romans 7 about a Christian struggling with sin? You know, Romans 7, that famous chapter in your Bible that talks about the Apostle Paul wrestling with his sin? I mean, verses 15, 18, and 19 just by themselves are iconic. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. That's the Romans 7 I'm talking about. It's famous because it's relatable. Paul struggled the way I struggle. His experience is my experience. But this is our Apostle Paul, an author of the New Testament and the pioneer of global missions. And he seems to be inexplicably overcome by sin. How can this be? And so we're forced to answer a pretty tough question. Is Paul talking about his life before he was a Christian or after? Is Paul describing a Christian experience we can all relate to or a non-Christian experience that doesn't apply to us? The answer, are you ready for this, is neither. But wait, you say, how can that be? There are only two types of people in the world, Christians and non-Christians, right? True, but the answer is still neither. That's because we're asking the wrong question. Romans 7 is not a passage about Christian versus non-Christian, but rather about Old Covenant versus New Covenant. The issue revolves around life before Jesus came in contrast to life after Jesus came. And when we understand Romans 7 in these terms, only then will we be able to answer our ultimate question, is Romans 7 about a Christian struggling with sin? This is actually a very important passage for you to understand, and it's very relevant for your life. How you interpret this chapter will affect the way you view your sin, the way you grow, and the way you even think about the gospel itself. If you haven't read Romans 7 before, or haven't read it for a while, I want to encourage you before we go any further to pick up a Bible and read it. Specifically, it would be good for you to read Romans 7, 1 through 8, 4. This will help you better track with what we are learning throughout the video. All right, time to strap in and hold on tight. We're about to cover a lot of material in a short amount of time. Are you ready? Let's go. It's really no secret that the book of Romans is all about the power of the gospel. I mean, one of the most famous verses in the entire book gives it away right from the get-go. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The book of Romans is about ready to introduce us to the full power of the gospel from every angle. But this Jew first, Greek second business Paul seems to just slap on to the end of the verse is just as important. It's not a footnote, it's vital to the message of Romans, and it's especially relevant to our discussion of Romans 7. You see, Paul begins to build a case that the gospel is for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew who's lived his entire life under the law of the Old Testament, or if you're a Gentile and you've never even heard of an Old Testament. Everyone is saved by the gospel and the gospel alone. But here's where things get interesting. Not only is everyone saved by the gospel alone, everyone also grows by the gospel alone. Now, how does that work? Well, the gospel not only gives you grace to be saved, it also gives you grace to change. Don't believe me? Just look at Romans 6:14. For sin will have no dominion over you. Okay, how's that possible? Because you are not under law, but under grace. That's how. In other words, what really gives us the power to change? It's not the law of the Old Testament. It's the gospel of grace. It's not the Old Covenant. It's the New Covenant. The Jews may have the law, but that's not what's going to help them change. The gospel alone will help them change. Because unlike the law, the gospel transforms the heart. This is sort of like Christianity 101, if you will. How does the gospel change my life? And it's Paul's point from Romans chapter 6 through 8. And what do you know, Romans 7 is smack dab in the middle of it all. So Romans 7 continues this discussion, that we Christians grow by the gospel alone. But there's just one teensy problem. What do you now do with this law of the Old Testament business? If everyone changes by the gospel alone, does that make the law bad? And now we begin to see what Romans 7 is really all about. Here's what you have to realize. Romans 7 is not just about changing by the gospel. It's specifically targeting whether or not the law can play any part in that. You can easily pick this up by just counting the number of times the word law shows up in Romans 7. 23 times. 
and almost all of them are talking about the law of the Old Testament. You see, Paul pulls aside the Jewish Christians at this point to have a heart-to-heart -heart with them about the law they cherish so much. He wants to affirm their love for the law because there's nothing wrong with the law. But he also doesn't want them to compromise on the exclusive role the gospel plays in changing their lives. As good as it was, the law could not keep them from sinning. In fact, it actually did the opposite. Its commandments gave them opportunities to put their sinful desires into action. That's because the law was never designed to make you more holy, like the Jews may have thought. It was designed to expose your sin and point you to the hope of a new covenant. So the law's not bad, but it couldn't grow them in godliness. It just showed how ungodly everyone really is. The Jews needed to hear this. Now we know he's talking to the Jews directly here, and not the Gentiles necessarily, because he starts out chapter 7 by saying, Or do you not know, brothers? For I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Those who know the law is just a roundabout way of saying the Jews. But in case you're still unconvinced he's talking to Jews, Paul says in verse 4 and verse 6 that these same people who know the law and are bound to it have died to the law and are now released from it. This has to be the Jews. It can't be the Gentiles, because the Gentiles were never bound to the law of the Old Testament and later released from it. Just skim Romans chapter 2 and you'll see what I'm talking about. But as Paul continues talking to the Jews about the law, he does something rather strange starting in verse 7. He stops talking about how the Jews relate to the law and starts talking about how he himself relates to the law. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. And as if things couldn't get any stranger, when we fast forward to verse 14, Paul starts talking about his life as if it's happening right now, as opposed to some time in the past. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. And this is where we start finding all those iconic verses I quoted at the beginning, about Paul struggling with sin at the present moment causing many to believe that Romans 7 is about a Christian struggling with sin. But wait a minute. Let's not get ahead of ourselves and jump to conclusions. We need to address the elephant in the room first. How on earth did we get from the Jews and the law to Paul in some kind of personal struggle with sin? In other words, why would Paul take such an unexpected detour from talking about the Jews to talking about himself? This is actually one of the most important questions you need to answer if you're going to crack the code of Romans 7. Here's the thing. If we've been paying attention to Romans so far, it shouldn't surprise us one bit that Paul does this. What we have to realize is that Paul has been substituting himself for the Jews all along throughout the book. Since Paul is himself a Jew, he sees the Jews and himself as interchangeable, and so he often swaps them out for himself throughout the book. Romans 3 is a good example of this. After showing how unrighteous the Jews are, out of nowhere, Paul starts talking about himself. Verses 3 and 4 talk about the Jews. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. But then in verse 7, Paul talks about himself. But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? But is Paul really talking about himself here? Not a chance. He's temporarily standing in for the Jews he just threw under the bus in verses 3 and 4. And we can further prove Paul is not talking about himself here because he says he's still being condemned as a sinner. Well, that can't be referring to Paul, because at this moment Paul is a Christian, and by his own admission later on in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what's he doing then? He's talking on behalf of the Jews using himself as a generic illustration of your average Jew under the Old Covenant and he tells it as if it's happening right now to make it real and relatable. And that's exactly what's going on in Romans 7. This is not a detour. Paul actually never left the topic of the Jews and the law in the first place. He just started using himself as a hypothetical illustration of it. And just like he did in chapter 3, he talks about this illustration as if it's happening right now, this very minute, because he wants to roleplay for them in a very tangible, relatable way what life was like under the law of the Old Covenant. And what was life exactly like under the Old Covenant? Well, unfortunately, Romans 7 doesn't paint for us a pretty picture. It was frustrating and hopeless. Although the Jews had the perfect standard of the law to tell them what to do, they found themselves unable to live it out. They found themselves enslaved to their sin. Sure, some Jews like the one Paul illustrates for us in Romans 7 had a deep, sincere desire to stop sinning. But frankly, 
none of them could. I mean, just look again at the three most iconic verses in Romans 7. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I get it. It's tempting to put yourself in Paul's shoes here. I'm with you, Paul. I've been there. But that's just it. You haven't. Because this isn't talking about life as a Christian, but about life as a Jew under the law. And the struggle this average Jew experienced is far different from yours. But how is it different, you say? It feels so similar. You have to understand, this Jew's not saying, I want to do what's right, but I do not do it. He's saying, I want to do what's right, but I cannot do it. This person's admitting he doesn't even have a chance to do what's right. You do, but he doesn't. Sure, you can feel trapped in your sin, but you're never actually trapped. You as a Christian can always get out. He can't. I mean, just look at him. There's no fruit to speak of in Romans 7. There's no repentance. There's no Holy Spirit to help him. There's no progress at all. Not even a little. There's only frustration. And the best thing he's got going for him, the only thing he's got going for him, is an earnest desire to do what is right. And even that is not enough to stop him from sinning. He's helpless. He's hopeless. He's got nowhere to go. This is the textbook definition of life under the Old Covenant. This is what life was like under the law without a transformed heart. Is it any wonder that Paul finishes chapter 7 so defeated? For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Jews before Christ were always haunted by this inescapable paradox. It was a nightmare of slavery to sin, from which you could never wake up. But this, this is what makes the gospel so amazing. Who will rescue this Jew from his nightmare of death? The answer comes in verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? Chapter 8 tells us why. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done, notice this, what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The law could not help the Jews change, God had to intervene with his spirit to break the stranglehold that sin had over his people. This was never about a Christian's personal struggle with sin. This has always been about the powerlessness of the law versus the power of the spirit. About the inability of the old covenant versus the ability of the new covenant. Paul goes out of his way in chapter 7 to make this clear to the Jews because he wants to debunk the myth that the law ever had any power to change their lives. Only the gospel has the power to do that. The same gospel that saved them is the same gospel that changes them. And the same gospel that changes them is the same gospel that changes the Gentiles too. Everyone changes by the gospel alone. So, is Romans 7 about a Christian struggling with sin? No, it's not. It's about your average Jew before the time of Christ, who's trying to do what's right under the power of the law. He may love God's law, he may have the best of intentions to obey God's law, but deep down inside, he's still imprisoned by his sin and is discovering that the law is unable to help him escape. That's the experience every Jew had before Christ. But praise God, those days are over. The gospel has changed everything. Everyone who believes in Jesus, Jew or Gentile, now possesses his spirit. And everyone who possesses his spirit is free from the tyranny of sin and can live free from sin. We all change by the gospel alone. And so, when we understand Romans 7 the way we're supposed to, we actually find real power to change. Instead of trusting in the law to magically help us obey, we trust in the power of the Spirit. Instead of turning to worldly methods to help us change, we turn to the grace of the gospel. No longer do we make a weak version of Paul our standard of godliness, 
No longer do we treat sin as an acceptable master. No longer do we define spiritual progress by our desires alone. No, now we get to see the full power of the gospel go to work on our lives. That's what Romans 7 is all about. It's not about a Christian struggling with sin. It's about the law's inability to change any of us, so that we may turn instead to the Holy Spirit, the power behind the gospel. Unlike those who went before you, you have that kind of hope. You can change today by the power of the Spirit, by the gospel alone.